This is Barry Zelma, Zelma on Insurance. I'm an attorney who has retired from the practice of law and now spend my time as an insurance claims consultant, an expert witness, an author, and producer of these videos. Today I'd like to give my opinion on whether the tort of bad faith has run its course. U.S. law was first organized using English common law. When a contract was breached, only contract damages could be recovered. Tort damages were limited to tortious conduct, and the two categories of damages were mutually exclusive. The primary purpose of damages for breach of a contract is to protect the promisee's expectation interest in the promisor's performance. Damages should put the plaintiff in as good a position as if the defendant had fully performed as required by the contract. Insurance, like all parts of modern society, is subject to the deprivations of the law of unintended consequences. The law can be defined as the understanding that actions of people, and especially of government or the courts, always have effects that are unanticipated or unintended. Insurance is controlled by the courts through appellate decisions, and by governmental agencies through statute and regulation. Compliance with the appellate decisions, statutes, and regulations, different in the various jurisdictions of the 50 states, is exceedingly difficult and, more often than not, very expensive. Insurance contracts can be simple, or exceedingly complex, depending on the risks taken by the insurer. Regardless, insurance is only a contract, whose terms are agreed to by the parties to the contract. Over the last few centuries, almost every word and phrase used in insurance contracts have been interpreted and applied by one court or another. Ambiguity in contract language became certain. However, the average person saw the insurance contract as incomprehensible and impossible to understand. Ostensibly, to protect the public, regulators decided to require that insurers write their policies in easy-to-read language. Because they were required to do so by law, insurers changed the words in their contracts into language that they hoped people with a fourth-grade education could understand. Precise legal language, interpreted by hundreds of years of court decisions, was disposed of and replaced with imprecise, easy-to-read language. After the creation of the tort of bad faith in the 1950s, if an insurer and insured disagreed on the application of the policy to a factual situation, Damages were no longer limited to the contract damages as in other commercial relationships. If the court found that the insurer was wrong, it could be required to pay the contract amount and additional damages for emotional distress, pain, suffering, inconvenience, punishment damages, attorney's fees, and any other damages the insured in the court could conceive. Insureds who were wronged by their insurer should have limited their recovery to contract damages based upon the hundreds of years of contract interpretation. 
they should have been compelled to waive the tort and sue in a sumsit. That is, ignore tort damages and sue for contract damages. If the tort of bad faith must exist, it must be applied equally. The abuse of the tort of bad faith has become so extreme that, in my opinion, the tort must be eliminated or somehow otherwise made fair. For example, in Essex Insurance Company versus Five Star Die House, a California Supreme Court decision, that concluded that while claims for bad faith breach of an insurance contract are generally assignable, emotional distress and punitive damages associated with such claims are not. As recognized by the courts, a claim for bad faith breach of an insurance policy consists of both a contract and a tort claim. An insured may assign the breach of contract acts aspect of the bad faith claim, but not the tort aspect. Case law has established that the proposition that an insured who has suffered damages in excess of an insurance policy's limit as a consequence of an insurer's bad faith failure to settle a claim may sue the insurer for breach of contract. Under settled principles, however, the insurer's duty to settle runs to the insured and not, not to the injured claimant. Consequently, an insurer owes no common law duty to a victim of a tort by the insurer's insured. Although the insured may assign his cause of action against the insurer for its breach of the duty to settle, he cannot, or should not, be allowed to assign the personal tort aspect of the bad faith cause of action because that aspect is not assignable, at least in California. It is not the nature of the relief provided by the tort of bad faith that prohibits a claim for emotional distress or punitive damages from being assigned. It is the nature of the underlying cause of action giving right to that relief. Because emotional distress and punitive damages flow from the personal tort aspect of an insurance bad faith claim, they should not be allowed to be assigned. However, when the facts involve injury to property rather than personal injury, the assignment of the punitive damages claim becomes incidental to the transfer of the breach of contract or property losses, and the assignee may pursue whatever punitive damages claim may exist by virtue of the matters alleged in the complaint. Consider Nelson v. Exxon, a 2009 decision of the California Court of Appeal. Although the bad faith claim scheduled an initially part of a bankruptcy estate, the bankruptcy code does not authorize the bankruptcy trustee to sell or assign assets that are not assignable under applicable state law. Therefore, when a bankruptcy trustee assigned a bankrupt estate's bad faith claim to another, the trustee could only transfer the economic property cause of action. A purely personal tort cause of action is not assignable, and it must be concluded that the damage for emotional distress was not assignable. The tort of bad faith seems to be, as some claims for uh, fraud and soft fraud and hard fraud discussed in earlier videos seem to be using the tort of bad faith as a method to convince an insurer and a court that the fraud perpetrated by an insured or a third-party claimant 
was a basis to refuse payment and that such a refusal was appropriate. The tort of bad faith involves, in addition, a great deal of effort by tort victims to set up insurers for bad faith cases by making policy limit demands early in a litigation or in a claim process with a very short period of time available to either to accept the settlement demand. The people setting up bad faith cases hope that the insurer will refuse their settlement demand so that they can later get a large judgment agreed to by the insured and then take an assignment of that judgment after it is resolved and sue the insurer for failure to accept a settlement demand within its policy limits. This kind of conduct is egregious and should not be allowed, but it happens almost every day. So the law of unintended consequences that brought about the major bad faith judgments after a simple breach of an insurance contract needs to be resolved. Presently, no one has even tried, but it is time for courts or state legislatures to enact laws or reach decisions that make a breach of an insurance contract nothing more than what it is, a breach of contract, and that the abuses that the insurance companies did that caused the tort of bad faith to be created has now been turned on its head. This video was adapted from my book, Selma on Insurance Claims, Part 106, Second Edition, which is part of a 10-volume treatise, Selma on Insurance Claims, Second Edition, available both as a Kindle book and as a paperback from Amazon.com. If you found this video to be of interest, or of use to you and your colleagues, please pass it on. It's free. And please subscribe to my YouTube channel, my Rumble channel, and my blog so that you can learn about future videos and blog postings. Thank you for your attention.